podcasts. And uh, one of my favorite ones is the Long Now Seminars. I don't know if good people have heard of this. There's a series of talks that happen monthly in San Francisco, sponsored by Stuart Brandt and some of his pals, including people like Danny Hillis and Brian Eno. And the notion is to imagine a 20,000 year span of time. And we're sitting in the present, right in the middle of that. And the challenge is, we've had, let's say, roughly 10,000 years of human civilization up until now. And the Long Now Project invites people to contemplate the next 10,000 years. Right? Will we even have another 10,000 years as a civilization? And then if so, what's that going to be like? So it's an exercise in getting people to widen their perspective on, on our place in, in history. Um, so however, if we zoom out and collapse the 10,000 years of the Long Now, or the 20,000 years, down to that little slice of, at the right there, uh, and consider our, not, not our species, but our genus, right? So genus homo, right? From the earliest caveman until now. That's like a million years, all right? So let's, let's kind of consider this million year time frame and start zooming in and looking for the emergence of the web, right? So we come in uh, by a factor of 10, right? There's the, there's the long now time frame, that little piece right there, right? And now we're looking at just 10% of the span of genus Homo on planet Earth, right? 100,000 years, no sign of the web. Uh, here is the, the long now time frame, right? Now we're in the 10,000 year span, um, no sign of the web, right? Down to 1,000 years, right? 0.1% of uh, the time in which hominids have been walking around on the planet and no sign of the web. Uh, and finally, on a sort of 100-year time scale, we see the emergence of the web, right? So, for most of the time that hominids have been walking around on the planet, this conversation wouldn't have made any sense. Right? So, you know, we have cave woman Susan and cave man Roger, and they have the conversation. Susan says, please give me your stone axe. And Roger says, I have a better idea. Roger is a, a tragically misunderstood early web thinker. <laughs> says, a better idea, I'm going to give you a link to the stone axe. And Susan says, what the heck? Right? What are you talking about? So this conversation made no sense a million years ago. It made no sense 3,000 years ago. Now it's a bronze axe instead of a stone axe, but it still doesn't make any sense. Um, and then in the Iron Age, right, a thousand years ago, it still doesn't make any sense. And even as recently as 20 years ago. So now it's a steel axe. But this conversation still doesn't make any sense, right? It's, it's, it's that recently that this started to make some sense. Right? Please give me a report. I have a better idea. Okay. I'll give you a link to the report. Cool. Now, the modern incarnations of Susan and Roger, right, these, 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 these modern web thinkers, are still fairly uncommon. This is not the normal scenario in most exchanges of information. Right? In most exchanges of information, in fact, that report would be an email attachment rather than a resource that was posted to some private or public web and communicated by way of indirection, by way of a link, rather than by the actual transfer of a copy of the report. Right? Um, and so this is a really, a really kind of fundamental thing, I think. I've, I've struggled for a long time with why is this stuff hard, right? I mean, um, there, there, is, there are a set of kind of core principles that I've been thinking about for a long time and I've been working on distilling down into a short list, and it's not complicated stuff, and it's not a, a, a long, it's not a large set of things, but um, but they don't tend to make sense to people yet, uh, and I think that this is why, right? I think that for a million years, hominids have been walking around on the planet, dealing with physical objects, and dealing with real social networks, and 
it's been a sliver of that amount of time in which we've had the opportunity to deal with virtual objects and virtual social networks. And the physics of virtual objects are different, are profoundly different in ways that we've yet to really, I think, internalize or define or explain to people or teach to people. Right? So um, this, is, this is kind of my mission now, is, is, is sort of tease out what are, what are, the, what are, what are the principles that govern the, the physics of virtual objects. Right? So for example, um, if I give you the steel axe, then for the duration of the time that you have it, I don't have the use of it. Right? Um, if I give you a link to a report, I have also the use of the report. I haven't given away my copy of it. Right? The copy of it is here, and we can both use the copy of it. Right? So, I mean, that's a kind of a basic thing about copy versus versus link. But um, so, for example, if I uh, if I improve the axe, right, the steel axe, if I sharpen it, right, you don't have the use of the improved axe. But if I improve the report and I've communicated it to you by way of a link then we both have access to the report. We both benefit from the improvement that was made. Uh, what's more, from a sort of social network perspective, the existence of a resource in some version of the web is a thing that is discoverable by many people, is a thing to which discussion, commentary, and reputation can be attached. So the report as a resource on the web is a thing that has a life of its own. And these are just properties that we, that we I think, in, people in this kind of an audience have come to take for granted. But most people aren't understanding how these things work. So I've been trying to figure out a, a way of bringing people to appreciate this kind of stuff. And it boils down to me to sort of seven things. And these are the, this is my short list of, of words that I'll expand on. Um, authority, indirection, structure, naming, scope, pub sub, by which I mean publish and subscribe, and, and services. So I'll kind of run through how I expand these words into a set of principles and how they would apply to the case of uh, Roger and Susan. But I'll also illustrate it in terms of a, an extended example that I've been working on. Uh, and so, the example is, um, so, so I work for Microsoft, and I'm in the part of Microsoft that is building out the cloud platform. We call it Azure. And so I've, I've chosen to do a project on Azure, which will demonstrate the kind of capabilities of the cloud, but will also uh, be a way in which I can bring people to experience the physics of virtual objects and networks. So uh, what it actually is, is a, a project to enable communities to collectively tell one another what is going on in those communities. So in effect, it's an events calendar. But it's an events calendar that's built on a different set of principles than any of the ones that we have now. Um, and uh, in particular, it's an invitation to think like the web. It's an invitation to say, what does it really mean when my information is managed as a virtual resource in a virtual network? versus thinking of my information as a physical object that I carry around and give to other people, give copies of to other people. So the, uh, the, the Elm, Elm City is the tagline for the town I live in, Keene, New Hampshire. So Keene is the Elm City. Um, and so there's a, 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 a calendar syndication hub running for uh, Keene, New Hampshire. There's one in all these other places. And you all are invited to start one up in your own communities if you, if you want. It's a free service. and uh, um, it, it could be interesting and, and, and helpful to you. You're welcome to do so, right? So um, the, the notion here is that uh, let's, say, let's say that I am a soccer club coach, and my soccer club has a schedule of events, right? So I, I would, let's say, manage my soccer club's schedule of events in, well, really any calendar program that is capable of publishing a web standard calendar format is called iCalendar, right? So I would publish in iCalendar, uh, and uh, it would syndicate to a hub. And from the hub, it could go to various places, right? It could go to someone else's 
personal calendar, or it could go, let's say, to multiple destinations. Right? But all this would be happening by, by reference rather than by value. Um, right? And all this would happen in a way that preserves the authority of the source of information. So as I thought about this, I wound up putting authority as the first thing on my list. I want people to, to be the authoritative sources of whatever information they are authoritative for. And I want them to publish those authoritative resources at well-known places on the web. Right? So um, in, in this example, right, uh, Susan asks Roger for the report. Right? And there's sort of two ways this can happen. Um, Roger can say, whoops. Oh. Roger can say, uh, Here's the email attachment, and he can CC Alice. Right? Or he can say, here's a link to the report, and he can CC Alice. Okay? So now Roger updates the report two times, um, and this is the situation. <coughs> Somebody else now wants the report. Right? So now Fred is involved. Okay? And Alice, who was, remember, CC'd by Roger on this attachment. Right? Uh, so the way things normally work, is that Alice is going to look in her inbox and say, oh yeah, I, I got a copy of that from uh, Roger last week. And now Fred wants it, so I'll forward the copy that I got from Roger to Fred. Right? Well, um, this is usually the result, is that Alice is sending Fred V1 of the report. Right? Whereas if uh, Roger had communicated a link to Alice, and Alice communicated the same link to Fred, then Alice and Fred and Roger and anyone else who got a copy of the link are pointing to the same copy. More importantly to me, it's the authoritative copy, right? So you see the URL notionally is bound in some way to Roger's identity. Right? So Roger is establishing himself as an authoritative source for information. Um, and that's a key principle. Um, how this plays out in the context of my calendar syndication scenario goes like this. So this is a, a real example. There is, in, in my town, a chess club. The chess club uh, meets, or used to meet, actually, on uh, Monday nights at 6.30 at a place called the Best Western Hotel. At that time, it was the case that the information existed in two places. Right? So the newspaper had received a copy of the information from the chess club. So the chess club had its website. The chess club website said, we meet on Monday nights, 6.30, at the Best Western Hotel. Right? And uh, then the, web, the, the club took a copy of this information, gave it to the newspaper. Please publicize our event. So the newspaper did that. And um, time went on, and the location changed. Right? So now, um, the situation looks like this. The club website has the correct information because the club is the authoritative source, really. It knows when and where it meets. Right? Um, the newspaper has gotten out of sync because the club forgot to notify the newspaper, or they did notify the newspaper, but whosever job it was to update the listing forgot to do it. Right? So there's sort of two things wrong here, in my opinion. Right? One is that the the, the club itself hasn't internalized the idea that it can and should be the authoritative source for its own data. Right? And the other part that's wrong here is that the newspaper doesn't have the idea that the club is the authoritative source for its own data. And what it really wants to do is subscribe to a data feed coming from the club so that it can then turn around and publish this information to its constituency so that the owner of the data is actually the party responsible for the timely and correct nature of the, of the information. Right. So, uh, so that's authority, and it's sort of related to this idea of indirection. So one of the things that everyone learns in computer science and in information science is the notion of the difference between what programmers call pass by value versus pass by reference. And it's the difference between, you know, in a, in a program, having a variable that you make a copy of and having a variable that you refer to by way of a pointer. Right? 
on the web, we have the exact same thing. We have links, right? So uh, Roger's report can be passed by value as an email attachment. It can be passed by reference as a link. And the properties of those two scenarios are very different. Um, but we don't, I think, ever teach this concept to anyone other than a computer scientist or an information scientist. But it's actually it's fundamental and it's relevant to, to everyone's work, and not just to, to, to the work of web and internet professionals, but to everyone. Right? So um, to spell this out in terms of the calendar syndication scenario, this is how things work right now in every newspaper, in every town on the planet. Right? Every newspaper has a notion of a community calendar. And every newspaper fills up its community calendar to the extent that it does with, with something like this. Right? The notion is, so I'm the chess club. I have my own website. My website has our calendar on it. And our calendar is authoritative. And I typed all that information into my calendar one time. That's all I should ever have had to do. But the, the, the model that we have now for publicizing your event says, well, no. In addition to having typed it in one time uh, on your own website, if you want to publicize your event through the newspaper, you come to the newspaper, you make an account with the newspaper, right? then you go and open up a form, and you retype all this information into their database. So now you've created an out of sync copy of your information. Um, and of course, there's never just one place to put it, right? Because you really want to publicize your event in all of the possible places where people could be looking. So the proposition to the chess club is normally one in which if you did the full Monty, it would involve, oh, you know, there's this newspaper and there's the hyperlocal website and there's such and such events calendar, and you know, and, and this plays out everywhere, right? Not just in communities. It plays out in, oh, I don't know, at a university scale. It's the same thing, right? You know, there's always this calendar chaos that results from the fact that it is not possible for there to be a single bucket that contains all the data. The data comes from different sources, right? And all of these sources need to be able to provide feeds that can be flowed together by some kind of a syndication hub. So, so the proposition uh, in, in the case of uh, the calendar syndication scenario is, uh, is this, right? It's like, yeah, you can still do it the old way if you want to. You can still send us a stale copy of the data. Um, but we would rather that you send us a link. We would rather that you pass by reference instead of pass by value, right? Because if you send us a link, <laughs> then you just have to publish one URL one time. And once you communicate that URL to us, and once we decide to trust it as a source of data, then all of your future events are going to flow through this channel. Right? Um, other people can subscribe to your data feed as well. Right? So the data that you publish on your website can flow correctly and reliably through the newspaper's publication mechanism, but it can also flow to other hubs. It can flow to other <coughs> attention hubs in which you would like your information to appear. And it can also flow, by the way, onto people's individual calendars. Right? Um, when you update it, everyone who's a downstream subscriber gets the right information. Right? So when the chess club says, no, the meeting's not at the EF Lane Hotel anymore, it's not at the Best Western, now it's at the EF Lane, they make that change, and everyone else in the network is immediately apprised of the change. Right? Well, things don't work that way now. I mean, things are radically not that way now, as, as we know, and, um, and this is why. So another huge reason why we're in this calendar chaos that we are is that a, a key principle is, is structure, and in particular, the difference between structured and unstructured information, which is another kind of a thing that we teach computer scientists and information scientists, but we teach no one else about this kind of stuff. Right? So we end up with these tragic kinds of situations like this. Right? This is uh, the Hopta High School in my town. This is the event calendar that is on the website of my high school. Right? 
it's a PDF file. It's a PDF file. And when I had a conversation with the high school principal about the notion of publishing a calendar in a form that was both human readable in, in one dimension and machine readable in another dimension, you know, he said, well, we, we, we posted weekly.pdf to the website. Isn't, isn't that good enough? And you know, I, I was really struck by that because I would hope that my school would be teaching my kids and other people's kids how the web works. And I would hope that my school would be teaching some of these fundamental principles. But um, they, they've never themselves been exposed to them. Right? And it really hit me. I mean, this guy, he's not a dumb guy. He's an educated, professional, competent person. But he's never been exposed to, to the idea that there's a difference between a PDF file and, let's say, an iCalendar file or an HTML file or an XML file. And that the difference is more profound than the spelling of the three-letter extension. Right? That these are different types of virtual objects with, different, with fundamentally different properties. Right? We don't teach people this stuff. They don't know it. Therefore, they don't ever get the chance to apply it. Right? So in, in the case of calendar events, right, this, is, this is how human beings talk about stuff. Right? The title, the location, right, written out in text. Um, if you look on the web, and if you go to almost any website where there is an events page, and they're very common on the web, you'll, uh, you'll see a web page or a PDF file or something like that, right? You'll see a textual representation of the information, which is for consumption by people. It's for people to read, print, forward as email attachments to their friends. Right? It's not data. It's not data that can be assimilated by networked computer systems and syndicated reliably through connected networks. Right? And so to indicate what I mean by that, um, this, this piece at the bottom here, this is an actual picture of a piece of an iCalendar file. Right? So this is, if you're in Google Calendar and you create a calendar, or if you're in Hotmail Calendar, or if you're in Outlook, or if you're in Apple iCal, right? All of these basic, common, popular calendar programs support an internet standard called iCalendar. iCalendar is so old that it predates XML. So this is what it actually looks like, right? If you were to go to your Outlook or Google Calendar and export your calendar in I ICS iCalendar format, Right? It would be a text file, and this is what I mean by structure, right? So, so, so the structure is, well, first of all, these are, this is the pre-XML version of tags, right? So there's a tag for date and DT start, date time start. There's a tag for the title, summary, location, and so on, right? Within that, there's an additional structure, right? So the, uh, the date itself is structured according to a particular convention, which is defined very precisely in the, in the iCalendar standard. Uh, and, and there's even another piece of it, right? So the another, another layer to the structure is the time zone, because it, you know, we, we live in this crazy world of time zones. And we don't all use UTC, so we have to have time zones. So, so um, you know, this is the way data needs to be published to the web if it's going to be possible for the information to syndicate, right? To be able to flow from point to point in the network reliably without loss of fidelity. Right? And this never happens. This almost never happens. If you go to 1,000 websites that have an events page on them, and you look at 1,000 events pages, you will maybe find one or two that provide a data feed, an iCalendar feed. Right? Mostly it's going to be, you know, we have a content management system the content management system has, in fact, got some kind of a database behind it. And in that database is some kind of structured representation of the dates and times and locations. But when we express the information on a web page, we lose all that structure. And we only publish the human-readable component of it. right? And we've lost the machine-readable piece of it. Uh, it's, it's, it's 
so common as to be almost universal. Now, there is an analogy here to RSS. And in fact, this, 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 this whole project of mine is an effort to bootstrap uh, an ecosystem of feeds, which is analogous to the RSS and Atom ecosystem in the blogosphere, in the sense that um, when you publish a blog page, what you're doing is publishing, in fact, in two formats. Right? So you're publishing the blog entry as an HTML page for someone to read. But you know, people may also be aware that there's a, a parallel representation as RSS or Atom. Right? Well, that's a data feed. That data feed is there so that your blog can be you know, automatically aggregated with other blogs through syndication hubs. And those syndication hubs can connect to other syndication hubs. And so for, you know, really since the dawn of blogging, we've had this mechanism. But we've never, we've never generalized it. Right? We've, we've, you know, we've never said, well, what's the, what's the principle that underlies that? Um, here's another. Uh, so, 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 so naming is, is, uh, is, is a huge topic for me. And um, here's, a, here's a page from uh, the, the, the calendar hub for Cambridge, Massachusetts from last week. Right? And there's a couple of, uh, couple of different versions of the same event. Right? Um, the, the MIT Sloan Investment Management Conference. And these are the, the URIs, the URLs for the event. And uh, you know, here's some kind of more, more names for that same event. Um, now, in the, in the world of web content management, there's a whole interesting discussion that we could have about the design of web URLs, right? the, the, the way in which the namespace that you create when you publish a set of resources to the web um, can and should be really a design artifact, and, and, and the way in which content management systems need to give you the freedom to control the design of your namespace. And, and there are um, a couple of books out there <coughs> This one in particular by some friends of mine called Restful Web Services has a great chapter in it, which is, uh, I think of it as the strunk and white of web <coughs> URL design. Right? In other words, you know, what, is this, what, is, what are the styles that you can use to make your web names rich and meaningful? Um, and you, know, you see some examples of that here. right? So some of these are incorporating uh, you know, locations and date information right into the URL and so on. But this isn't actually what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about, um, well, first of all, one of the names that's missing, right, is this, right? So there is no, there is no iCalendar feed for the MIT Sloan Investment Conference, right? There's no way for the MIT Sloan Management School to flow its calendar information in a way that can be recombined in other places, right? And really, what, what there ought to be is, as I've said, there's, there needs to be this kind of parallel structure, right? Where there's, you know, so the events.html, that's the web page, right? You go to you know, the, the Sloan School, and there's the web page, and you can read the content, right? In parallel, there needs to be this other thing. There needs to be this other thing that enables that set of information to exist as data on the web in a form that can be combined with other similar information. Um, but here's another thing, right? So there isn't actually a tag, I, I, I looked, and there isn't a tag for the Sloan conference that I can find. Um, now, in this kind of an audience, we take it for granted, right? It's kind of an amazing thing. But we, we all, in our little circle, as a first order of business at every conference after, you know, where are the bathrooms, is what's the tag? What's the tag for this conference? And it's a pretty miraculous thing that we kind of take for granted, right? Because with the tag, we now know that we can, um, we can federate information about the conference from all of the people in this room, from anyone who's not in this room but is interested in the conference and maybe participating from afar, you know, in many different services online, right? Um, but it's even more amazing than that, right? Because so. The name, uh, so, so assume that the, that the conference chose the tag Sloan Invest 11, right? That's 14 characters. If you had, uh, if you were trying to write a tweet, you'd have plenty of space left to say something about Sloan Invest 11, right? And by the way, it's, it's, it's actually quite unique, right? There actually aren't any um, Google or Bing pages that contain that tag right now, right? So I went to my favorite scientific calculator, which is Wolfram Alpha. 
And I, I looked up the number of permutations. So Sloan invest, that tag is 14 characters long. Right? So how many permutations of 14 characters are there? Well, uh, 10 to the 21st. That's a large number. Right? That's on the order of the number of grains of sand on the Earth. So you're, you've got a large namespace to work with here. Um, this, these are some estimates of the size of the index. Right? So uh, Google, 33 billion pages, right? Three times 10 to the 10th. Bing, maybe a third of that right now. So you know, it's kind of not surprising, right, that out of the namespace of the number of grains of sand on the Earth, we should be able to choose something that's unique to the whole web. I mean, the web seems big, but grains of sand on the Earth is bigger, right? So you know, 33 billion, if that's the size of the indexed web, right? That's, uh, oh, I don't know, on the order of the number of stars in our galaxy. It's also like a really unimaginably large number. Right? But so let's but let's look, right? I mean, no web pages contain search term slow and invest eleven right? in either of those search engines. So if we if we take thirty six times ten to the fourteenth, right? Thirty six to the fourteenth, right? and we subtract the web. So take away the 33 billion permutations of all of the existing names on the web right now. Right? Um, the answer is the same. Right? So the, the permutations of this tag are way bigger than we can even think about. Right? But the thing is, well, let me, let me, let me go back to this for a minute. So what does this mean? It means that you have the power to invent a name. Right. A name that is easy for people to remember, a name that you can put into a tweet, a name that you can simply include in free text in any document that you publish to the web. Uh, and it will be unique on the day that you create it. And the next day, if you use it and if other people use it, it will be found reliably on the indexed web. In other words, if people at Sloan were using the Sloan Invest 11 tag, um, if they were using it on Twitter, if they were using it on Delicious, if they were simply using it as a string of characters in a blog post that they wrote, it would be indexed by Google and Bing, and the next day you would be able to search and find the, just that set of documents. Right? It's, a, it's, an, it's, a, it's a, an amazing, a miraculous thing. Um, and I think that I don't know. We, you know, there's a there's a few things about this that we haven't fully appreciated, and one of them is that we tend to think of it as oh, it's a, it's a it's a Twitter tag. Well, no, it's not just a Twitter tag, right? So so here's an example of um, uh, are people aware of a service called Yahoo Pipes? Yeah. So so at one point I wanted to be able to pull together multiple streams for a tag, right? So I had some tag, and some people were using Delicious, and some people were using Twitter. And some people were posting to WordPress blogs using the tag. Right? Well, why shouldn't I be able to merge all of those streams together into one thing? And it turns out to be very easy to do that. And this is a, a, a Yahoo pipe that I built that, that does that. right? So it simply queries Twitter and Delicious and WordPress and, I don't know, Flickr and whatever for, for the same tag. Each of those queries produces a feed. Those feeds can be flowed together, and there you have kind of a broader perspective on locating resources that are bound to that tag. But it's even, of course, larger than that, because as I said, you can simply search the open web and find this stuff. So you know, that's, that's the kind of surprising and I think non-intuitive property of the virtual object, which is a web resource that has a name that you gave it. right? And I mean, there are different kinds of names you can give things, URLs being one, tags being another. Um, so scope is another another huge thing for me. So this is um, this is Hotmail calendar, and there's there are two calendars here merged together, right? So one of them is my private calendar, and it's got things on it like you know fly to Philadelphia and visit mom. Right? The other one has things on it like square dance and you know community singers and things. So um, what this means is that I am operating two calendars in parallel. One of them 
is scoped to my myself or to my friends and family. And the other one is scoped globally. Right? And this is a general strategy that I think people need to understand and apply. Um, Is that, is that clear? Right. That because because I think that that, that with uh, with calendars right now on the web, people tend to think about a calendar as a tool for personal information management. Right? And I want people to think about a calendar program as a tool <laughs> that feeds into potentially multiple scopes of interaction. Right? So it's appropriate to have a calendar for yourself. It may be appropriate to have a calendar for your department or group in a company. And it will certainly be appropriate to also have a calendar for the company as a whole, the organization as a whole, the community as a whole. Um, and uh, you know, so we, we need to be able to think about operating at these different scopes. Um, a, a parable that uh, I have used is, uh, I, I, I wrote something on my blog a couple years ago. And the title was, uh, Too Busy to Blog? Count Your Keystrokes. Right. And the idea was this, right? The idea was, you know, I can, uh, I can type, I don't know, 500 keystrokes a minute, right? And uh, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, and this is the number of people who are going to be influenced by each of my keystrokes, right? And this is the, the influence, the total influence of all my mad typing over the years, right? Is some, 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 some variable, I, right? So how do I make my influence in the world grow, right? Well, I can't change how fast, I can maybe type a little faster, but that's not gonna make much difference, right? I can't change the number of minutes in an hour, number of hours in a day, number of days in a year. I can't change how many years I've got left, right? There's only really one thing I can change. That is, how many people are gonna be potentially influenced by these keystrokes that I've typed. So the way that I think about that is to say, look, you've got something to communicate. And uh, it's mostly for the people in your immediate group, your department, your team, your, 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 your division in your company even. Right? But it's not necessarily restricted to that audience. Right? In fact, you're saying something which is of potentially general interest. Um, it could, it, there's nothing confidential about what you're saying, right? It's information that you wouldn't mind someone across the world discovering and adding something valuable to, right? So why not think about pushing that piece of information that you wish to communicate to the widest possible scope, right? And then, by definition, everyone else is included within that scope, right? So if it's appropriate to put it on a public blog, but it's also relevant to people inside my company, then put it on the public blog and notify the people in your company that you want to know about that, that it's there. Right? But it means you've created the possibility to influence, I don't know, an open-ended number of people by making that effort in communication. So that's the, that's the sort of scope idea. Um, PubSub is, uh, so, so, so this is another sketch of the, of the, of the, of the uh, Elm City calendar syndication idea, and it's you know it really it's kind of a mesh architecture, right? So imagine the soccer club and the folk song society, and they're uh, they're publishing data, and the data that they publish can be subscribed to by let's say Philly.com, right? Um, Philly.com can in turn be subscribed to by people's individual calendars, but people's individual calendars can also be publishers of information to which Philly.com is a subscriber, right? So this is, a, this is the notion of pub, sub, publish and subscribe, right? It's a fundamental communication pattern. Um, and uh, it's not, it, it shouldn't be surprising to us, but we have never, it's another one of those things we've never really sort of defined and explained to people. So in fact, uh, Facebook and Twitter are, are kinds of examples of this, right? You know, in Twitter, it's, it's a pub sub deal in the sense that you know, I am publishing my Twitter feed. You can choose to subscribe to my Twitter feed, right, or not. But it works the other way around, right? I can uh, choose to subscribe to your Twitter feed, or not, right? So we're in, it's a it's a network in which everyone 
is potentially both a publisher and a subscriber. It's the same with Facebook. Right? I mean, your activity stream on Facebook is effectively publishing a feed to which all of your friends on Facebook are effectively subscribed. And conversely, that's true. Right? Um, the blogosphere uh, is this model in a more general way because it isn't confined to the silo of any particular service, right? So now you could publish a feed on a WordPress blog, and I could subscribe to it from a different tool, and someone else could publish in TypePad, and someone else could subscribe. So in other words, there's a set of standards that govern this stuff, right? And uh, the tag idea, as I said, is even more general, right? It just crosses all the boundaries. So uh, the, the, the publish and subscribe communication pattern is one of those fundamental things that we need to define and we need to explain how common scenarios that people are familiar with are actually built on top of that underlying pattern and then how people can think about applying that pattern to themselves. Right? And uh, the last thing is this notion of services. So um, you know, my, my calendar syndication and service itself uses a bunch of other services, right? So it pulls event sources from these different things, so then pull upcoming events like Facebook, it uses Delicious for some things, it uses Twitter for messaging, it uses Frenzy for collaboration, and so on, right? It actually also provides a service, the service of, uh, of event aggregation. Um, and um, this, is, this is kind of the, the, the evolution of services and web thinking, right? Um, when Roger says, I'm giving you the email attachment, he's not making much use of services or he's not really thinking like a web person. Um, when he gives a link to the report, it's more, it's more embedded in a framework in which there is an expectation that there are services that enable things to happen. Right? So in fact, when I give you the link, what I'm saying is I'm actually expecting that there's a service which is going to answer when you visit that link. Right? So we start to be more and more embedded in a network of services. Um, and uh, this would be an even more advanced version of it. Right? Here's a tag for all versions of the report and all of the supporting documents. So now I'm depending on a more ambitious kind of a service, a service that can not only resolve the URL and give back the resource that it points to, but a service that is helping to draw together to syndicate or federate a set of resources. Right? And um, you know, I think we're all beginning to experience what it's like to be embedded in this world of cooperating services. I want also people though, to, to, to be able to think about themselves as providers of services, not only consumers of services. Right? So when you invent a tag, for example, and when a group of people consistently apply that tag to a set of resources, you don't think about it, but you've actually created a service on the web right? in the sense that you've now made it possible for people to go to Twitter or to go to Google and Bing, or to go to Delicious, and pull together all of the set of things that you've identified with that tag. Right? So you've actually created a new service, a service of the service of finding things that have this tag attached to them. Right? And I think that, that that's a, also a, a useful thing to encourage people to, to think more about as as producers of services as well as consumers. Right? So we publish and subscribe, we produce and consume services, um, and uh, that's it.